Greetings, my fellow wealth hackers. This is the Truth About Real Estate Investing Show. My name is Erwin Cito, and I trust everyone's doing well. <laughs> uh, I laugh because uh, we are locking down in Ontario again, or emergency break, whatever the term is. At uh, it's, I'm recording this on Friday, so at 12 a.m. tonight, we'll be back into, I don't know what it is now. Uh, anyways. Well, the weather at least is improving, <laughs> so we can all spend more time outdoors and the sunshine and fresh air. Uh, I know my family is excited for the scheduled pool opening. I have written May 1st, but it's since been revised. <laughs> Our plan is to have the pool open before, uh, quote unquote, April break. You know, what was known as March break. Our pool will be open for April break. <laughs> I know it's a bit early, uh, but I read that Japanese blossoms in Japan are in bloom the earliest it's ever been since 8, 812, year 812. Yes, 812 as in 1,200 years ago. Uh, this has been the most recent, the, the earliest bloom, full bloom of Japanese blossoms in Japan. So maybe global warming is a thing. <laughs> Fingers crossed for an early, for early summer weather. If it doesn't work out, we'll just crank the heat anyways. <laughs> uh, my indoor Peloton bike has arrived, uh, paid for with my stock hacking returns. It arrived uh, just last weekend. Uh, who knew home exercise equipment would be so popular? Uh, for those who don't know, I ordered a Peloton bike in December, and, and it arrived March 27th. <laughs> so these things are hot commodities. I imagine even more so now since gyms are being requiring to close for the next month. Uh, um, I'm sure <laughs> the price of my bike has gone up significantly since I paid for it, but there's no way I'm selling it. I need to get rid of my own COVID-15, as in the 15 extra pounds I'm carrying around. Uh, new, the new indoor bar, indoor bike is still covered in plastic, uh, uh, sitting in my new house because the the kitchens and bathrooms are still being renovated. Our bathroom's almost done. I'll I'll post the the video to Instagram of the um, of one of our bathrooms. Uh, hopefully, everything will be done by Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, as that's the date of the moving truck shows up and we move in. Uh, I Please wish us luck. <laughs> I really do not enjoy moving houses. Uh, I, I like my routines, but with moving houses, you know, you have all the packing, organization, moving, plus we're moving into a house with less storage space. Uh, there's no shed, and there's no backyard shed, so this isn't easy. Um, thankfully, our live-in nanny has done most of my packing. <laughs> uh, I do love having a nanny. Uh, once once in our new house, I'll have her learn how to use Cherry's housewarming present, a uh, Traeger wood-fired barbecue. Uh, it's, a, it's really a smoker more than a barbecue, uh, which is really more of an oven than a barbecue. Uh, but I can't wait for our name to smoke us some salmons and some briskets and some wings and i can't wait to entertain friends and family in our new backyard uh speaking of friends and family if you'd like to be part of more uh, more of a part of our day-to-day -day journey to financial freedom we are hiring two real estate professionals aka coaches aka realtors with real estate licenses to join our team to service our wonderful clients in the areas west of toronto if you've listened to past episodes with my coaches chris the captain hook James Money Bags Mags, and Tammy the Duplex Queen, uh, and also Tim Clapback Hong. Besides getting a cool nickname, uh, they're all really successful wealth hackers, uh, and hopefully being a part of my team has uh, helped them along the journey. For more information, go to www.infinitywealth.ca slash hiring. Again, that's www.infinitywealth.ca slash hiring. On to this week's show. This week, we have a former Airbnb executive who was responsible for much of Northeast, Northeast America, North America. So that means a whole large chunk of, uh, of Canada as well. But he left his dream job to start uh, life at Key, where he is making a difference by making real estate, specifically condos available to folks with as little as 2.5% down. Yeah, you heard that right. As little as 2.5% down. And this is not a traditional rent-to-own investor strategy at all. I've never heard of anything like this before. So for you social capitalists like myself, I hope I really hope you enjoy this show. Uh, Daniel Dubois shares his journey uh, with his own startup. He had a startup before he joined Airbnb. And he shares how that journey went, his experience at Airbnb. He even has some advice for Airbnb operators because I know some of you on the show are, are doing that or are plans to do so. Yeah, uh, and 
also and then of course he explains his newest business that he is the co-founder president of life at key uh, this is easily one of my favorite episodes of this year so please enjoy the show oh also before <laughs> before i go <laughs> i forgot daniel will also be our guest speaker april 17th at the iwin meeting saturday morning april 17th to share how life at key works how democratization of real estate works in case you know anyone who has trouble getting into the real estate market this is this would be a wonderful method opportunity to get into it or if you'd like to be able to do something like this on your own uh, so if you're already on my email list you'll be receiving the invite if you're not on my email list just go to any of my websites put in your your name and email uh, www.truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca or infinitywealth.ca uh, again put in your email email address and you'll be on my email list and you'll, re- you'll be receiving these invites all right enjoy the show hi daniel what's keeping you busy these days Hey, Aaron. Great to be here. Thanks for coming. I know you're busy. My word. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to trying to eat the world here, put a dent in the universe. But um, yeah, it's uh, everyone has the same amount of time. We're all we're all busy these days, but busy and loving it. Hopefully, right? But you're doing big scale stuff. You know what? I feel like there's not that big of a difference for the level of busyness or hard work that I'm putting in compared to the person running a corner store right now, trying to stay alive with COVID, right. And trying to keep their businesses afloat. So I firmly believe that to run a coffee shop compared to running a exponential organization that's global is similar amount of work. (laughs) Okay. I think it's just like who, you know, the bigger the mission, the, the bigger the magnet towards talent that actually is attracted to joining mm-hmm. you and helping you on your journey. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, compared to my in-laws run a, run a bakery, right? It's a great bakery. They have incredible food and it's called uh, Batard Boulangerie in Vancouver, if anyone's in Vancouver. And uh, it's a great, great spot. They work hard. They work extremely hard to keep the bakery afloat um, and, to, and to do well. And all the respect in the world to small to medium-sized business owners um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to work on something that's venture backed that we can really swing for the fence. And, um, so there's no complaints for my level of busyness. I'm honored to be able to, to serve in this way. Before we talk about swinging for the fences, how is your in-laws business doing? They're actually doing very well. Um, yeah, they, uh, they made some adjustments when COVID hit. They, uh, they removed the front of the, the house staff, um, they limited how many people could work in the back of the house and they did all online ordering uh, with pickup windows and the, the community they're on Fraser street in Vancouver have been super supportive and they're actually, uh, their numbers are lower than they were in the past, but their profit is higher than ever. They're actually in a much, much better place mm-hmm. because their overhead is so low. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a finite amount of capacity of how much they can actually produce being in a limited amount of space mm-hmm. and they're uh yeah they're they're doing great with how much they're able to actually create with a small but mighty team and limit the menu selection yet um yet uh yet just have a, a much more dialed process without you know people coming in and opening up their laptops <laughs> working in the space and you know they just come they pick up their bread they head out come back the next day right but yeah they're, they're doing well thanks for asking did you help them with the internet stuff? Because I understand you're good with this stuff. <laughs> my wife did. Yeah, my wife was definitely very grateful for my wife quickly put together a Shopify store. And um, yeah, it's, be, it's been working really well. It's actually, it's, it's a really cool concept. Um, it wouldn't be a great podcast for a different topic, but they actually bought um, bought a farm that was just a mud pit on Salt Spring Island, just destroyed. It was a puppy mill and the guy was getting... Uh, a cease and desist on his land. They bought it for $200,000 under land value. So speaking of real estate, Salt Spring Island, everything's over, over value, right? There's always a bidding war. This was about three years ago. So it's probably doubled in value now. They've completely uh, cha- transformed this 10 acre lot and they're, uh, they've are they created a, a hobby farm for their retirement. They have, they have sheep, they have, uh, you know, a ton of different, they have roosters and chicken and uh, they have a giant jo- dojo on the property <laughs> and uh, and they're doing a farm to table style bakery now. So they're growing. They've started a flour company. They've started a tea company. 
So it's, yeah, it's really cool. And it's great, great real estate investment pre-COVID to get a 10 acre self-sustaining farm. For 200 um, grand? Yeah, for, you for 200 to grand under, ask, uh, under a oh, land okay. value. So it's about, I think they paid like 600 grand and it's got to be worth like, you know, 1.5 at least right now, maybe right. two. That's a good investment. Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> yeah, they've they've done extremely well in their uh in their their fix and flip investments in Vancouver, which is a crazy market in and amongst itself. Okay, so uh, nope. so I asked the I I assumed that you would have helped them with the internet stuff since you you have uh, like everyone knows you, uh, prior to what you, your current work is everyone knows you as one of the Airbnb early folks. Can, can nope. you can you elaborate on that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, I was a big fan of Airbnb for a very long time. Uh, my first venture-backed company was when I was in college, and it was in the sharing economy space. Before it was even called the sharing economy, it was called collaborative consumption at the time. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to figure out how I could learn more about this rise of being able to use technology to help people share underutilized assets, whether that be space, whether it be items, whether it be our time and energy. So you've seen everything, the rise of Uber and Instacart and so many other sort of gig economy type work. So uh, so with with um, my uh, time at Airbnb, actually before joining Airbnb, my time in college starting a company in the space, I actually went to San Francisco and I interviewed Airbnb when they were just a small startup. And I also interviewed leaders from Google and Facebook and the first ever co-housing work or co-housing um spot and it was called rainbow mansion they had nasa employees and everyone was sharing this big house together and they're paying 750 dollars a month rent each um and the embassy that had a bowling alley in their in their uh, in their house this beautiful mansion in downtown san francisco and you're paying about 1100 dollars um compared to at the time people were probably paying for a bachelor you know 2200 dollars in san francisco right for like a basement suite so Co-housing was at the time just like starting to really bubble up. Met with the first co co-working space at the time. Of course, that um, ecosystem has has uh, has blown up in many different ways, <laughs> imploded, you could say. But at the same time, a uh, lot of momentum. Uh, it'll so come back. Work, it will come back. It will come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm for sure. People sure. are sick of working from home. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I've heard WeWork is doing decently well even right now uh, with the pandemic. Um, but uh, but who knows if, how true that is. All that to say that the Twitter hashtag was invented in the space, but it was a lot of fun. You know, I was 21 years old. I had a uh, someone who helped out as my film crew that I connected off off uh, Craigslist, and and uh, yeah, I was just from that moment and on just was such a fan of Airbnb. I had uh, someone from Airbnb who joined my advisory board. I met him on a panel in Banff. We were speaking on a panel together. And the next speaker after us was Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple. <laughs> so we had this, like, the room was just absolutely packed, but not to listen to us for us to get off the stage. To yeah, you were the opening to act. <laughs> yeah, for, exactly. Yeah, um, one of the greats. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, anyways, and it was uh, super grateful for the mentorship and support of a gentleman by the name of Aaron Zifkin, who was on my advisory board. and. And then I was, uh, I had an unsolicited offer to, for my company to be acquired and went back to a number of different people I was close to. And Aaron told me, what about Airbnb acquiring you? And that started a conversation. I ended up selling to a company called Leave Town, also in the real estate tech world and, uh, and continued the dialogue with Airbnb though. Um, and, and Aaron and a team that I got quite close to and, um, had the opportunity to sell my company to leave town, but still join Airbnb and have a pretty fun role with a ton of autonomy and very entrepreneurial and manage different markets. Like um, was hired for Western Canada, never managed Western Canada one bit, <laughs> managed some, some in Eastern United States and then uh, interior Eastern and Atlantic Canada. Really it's Toronto, Montreal are the big markets in the Canadian side, but yeah, it was a ton of fun. One of the fastest growing companies of all time, right? Um, and I saw firsthand a ton of different forms of real estate investing that we can dive into on this podcast if you're interested. But everything from the rent arbitrage to, you know, the, the lease to sublease models to uh, to buying up trailer parks and stringing white white lights and uh, trying to, to make it an on-brand experience for tiny homes or yurts or bubble, ho- bubble hotel models. Um, yeah, just a... A lot. And, and then also just a rise in um, 
and sort of the, the property management side uh, where you can manage multiple listings on behalf of others and then air sorted and Sonder and Domeo and the list goes on. So I don't know how, how deep your uh, listenership is on the, on the short-term rental side, but we can go there if you'd like. We might be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this could be a big podcast. First, first question, D- D- Daniel, do you know what number employee you were? Uh, no, I, d- I don't know, but I wasn't there super early. I mean, it was like, I, I think uh, around like 3,000 or something like that. So right. yeah, yeah, wasn't there very early. What's it now? I don't know. Uh, I know that the, when COVID first hit, they laid off 2,000 employees. Um, All right. So that, I think that was around 25%. I think they were probably around 8,000 employees when, when that happened. Right. So, so still pretty early. So you know what's crazy? The year before I joined Airbnb, they're or shortly before I joined Airbnb, they're ranked the number one place to work in the world by Glassdoor. And then um, by the time I actually joined, um, and I say in the time I actually joined because I was in conversation with them for so long leading up to it, um, was uh, there was they didn't even make the top 100. And I think the part of that is because they scaled from around 300 employees to about 3,000 employees. And that's a very different company at 3,000 employees and 300. Just and the uh, difficulty, the growing pains. Yeah, the, the growing pains. And But like I found it a magical, an amazing place to work. I had a ton of fun, but there was definitely growing pains. But Airbnb is such an incredible organization that they were able to move extremely quickly. And uh, there was never a, re- or never a reorg at Airbnb. It was always a redesign. So there's constantly these redesigns where the company would completely reshuffle I don't know. I had probably nine managers um, while I was at Airbnb for how many different roles I uh, <laughs> I was in. So, and the joke at Airbnb is everyone has four full time jobs. There's so yeah. I got to I got to see a lot of the business, which was great. Mm-hmm. Okay, what what are some of the highlights of your experience then? Oh, I think I think meeting the hosts, like just being super. Uh, and meeting the people that I got to work with, you know, there's, I, I don't know how many resumes Airbnb would receive for one filled role, probably like, you know, 5,000, something ridiculous to have such a lean company. Actually, the, when I was there at Airbnb, there's maybe 3,000 employees globally, but that's a lot of different sorts of support staff and different aspects of the business. There's four main uh, pillars of Airbnb at the time. There was, mm-hmm. there was uh, China, there was experiences. There then Airbnb acquired luxury retreats. So luxury retreats became a part of the business. And then there was a homes business. So most people, when you say Airbnb, you're talking about the homes business. We were actually only 700 employees when I was at Airbnb. So you can imagine it was valued at, they closed a financing around $30 billion. So 700 people managing a $30 billion company. So that, that, that's just like, it's a lot of fun, right? Like I was... I was managing three quarters of all of Canada at 25 years old. So, um, and you knew yeah, exactly just, what you were doing, right? <laughs> and the, and the, the thing is Airbnb, the, the business worked so well that it was hard to take any credit for anything because it felt like monkeys could, could operate the company, right? It just felt like the, there was such consumer pull. People just love the product so much. There's such a strong brand, right? If you Airbnb to booking.com, booking.com, so transactional, right? They're a machine. They're, you know, a hundred billion dollar company. They're wildly successful, but still it's very transactional in nature. Airbnb is aspirational. It's emotional. You know, it's, it's something that you want to be a part of. You, you go, if you went and booked a vacation rental on booking.com, you tell your friends that you're staying in an Airbnb, right? It's almost, it's that, it's that powerful of a brand now. Um, and yeah, it was like, even before joining Airbnb to just follow along on the journey and just see, I remember speaking, I spoke all over the place, all around the world on the sharing economy on the speaking circuit when I was in college. And I, uh, I remember speaking at uh, different events and I would put on the screen how Airbnb reached 5 million guest arrivals and like this exponential growth curve. And I remember the following year speaking on how Airbnb, how last year I showed this slide showing 5 million guest arrivals. And now they're at 10 million guest arrivals that they've, they're already growing exponentially. And since then they've grown, they've continued that incredible pace They're at 10 million guest arrivals. When I joined Airbnb, they're at about 80 million guest arrivals. 
So that's like, that's pretty significant growth from when I was like feeling, you know, like I was their biggest ambassador. I would speak at an event and ask how many people knew of Airbnb and no one would put up their hand. Right. And then once in a while, one, a few people put up their hands. Then I would start speaking at events and I'd say, how many people have stayed in the Airbnb traveling for work? And no one would put up their hand. I spoke at an event in 2017, um, a marketing conference, and it was like the entire audience put up their hands. It was just amazing to see how much the world has changed. When I left Airbnb in early 2019, uh, Airbnb had around 400 million guest arrivals. And I'm sure today they're over a billion, you know? So it's pretty amazing that it was at 5 million guest arrivals, it felt like they were a wild home run. You know, it's just like this incredible platform and their growth is just sustained. There's no, it's crazy. Their IPO has been amazing to watch and to, you know, participate on the sidelines. And, uh, and, and I try not to check the stock too often, but uh, the fact that they're a hundred billion dollar company is like, it's amazing. It's crazy. A year when no one would have expected that a year from today when COVID first hit, Yeah, they lost, you know, 90% of their revenue in two weeks. Yeah. It'll come back. Savings yeah. are high and people are dying to travel. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's, it, this is this um, once in a century type event, and there's probably going to be a once in a century type rebound when it comes to travel. <laughs> it's it's going to be nuts. nuts. Like, oh, you, yeah. Like, yeah. Could you just imagine what Vegas will be like? Like, uh, yeah. You know, like six months from now? Yeah. Like it, <laughs> it'll just be packed. I wonder what, I wonder what <laughs> Vegas is like now. I'm sure there's like a lot of people that just don't care. And Yeah, but, but I'm sure it's quiet. Yeah. Oh, versus yeah, exactly. like versus exactly. like all everything will be everything will be all the airbnbs all the hotels will be packed like you can't get yeah. a room right? yeah like it'll, it'll be sunday night you still can't get a room <laughs> no. but you were able to participate in airbnb as well when they when they went initial public offering yeah i had i had stock options for my time there um so was able to to get in and um yeah very grateful for that and um part of the reason that uh that originally when I started Key, I wanted Key, we're a opco propco model. Originally, I wanted it to be one entity so that not only could I help people get access to home ownership, but they'd also have shares in a venture-backed company as if they were getting in early at a company like Airbnb. But mm -hmm. uh, but what I realized is that would cause brain damage, right? People want to own real estate. They don't want to have to understand the nuances of a company and the growth yeah. rate and everything else. So. But yeah, I was super grateful for, for being able to uh, have that time at Airbnb. Um, you asked me, this all started with you asking me what is what was my highlight, right? And outside of working with all the incredible pe people there that were value aligned and value add and just wanted to contribute to that incredible mission of creating a world where anyone can belong anywhere, it was being on the other side, working in ops and being able to travel the world. I was on about 300 flights in two years. I was constantly staying and just... <laughs> beautiful or unique or maybe dodgy Airbnbs around the world. And I loved it. I just like, I was a, I was a child in that sense, as far as I would stay, if there was ever a unique Airbnb, I would always pick that, you know, I, was, I would stay in a caboose in the Smoky Mountains as an example. Right. Or I just try that, to find that literally it. happened. That literally happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. It was a caboose that was, uh, that, that had, um, two bunk beds. So it had four beds in the caboose. It had hot water, a flushing toilet, a, a, um, a shower, uh, and a little, a little kitchen area on, on the caboose. So that was a you're Bryce, a tall guy. <laughs> I'm a tall guy. <laughs> That's like, we made it work. You know? And if you looked at all the reviews on this caboose, I don't know if you have show notes, I can probably track down the actual listing and all the reviews are like, my kids love this place. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, um, my wife and I uh, stayed and enjoyed it. And we, yeah, we've stayed in amazing places, especially in the Smoky Mountains in North Carolina. It's a pretty special place. There's a, uh, it almost, some places it feels like you're surfing the trees, you know, these homes that are just built above the tree line and on top of mountains. And you have all the smoke, all the, the clouds rolling in and you can't see any development at all. You wake up in the morning, you just have this massive patio overlooking what looks like a giant rainforest um yeah just a different world and being from vancouver originally i'm from mountains and ocean right but being able to experience other aspects of that still in north america um like there's nothing 
more polarizing than the Vancouver beach compared to like the outer banks of North Carolina. Right. But it was just, yeah. And what you realize is when you travel a ton, when you're constantly on the road and especially when you travel outside of North America as well, you realize that we're all 99% the same, you know, we're all like, you, you just, there's nothing I want to do more than when I see any form of di- discrimination in the world than to just buy someone an Airbnb travel voucher and say, go, just like, just go, just go travel, stay with people, break bread with them. And there's a, and it's a great way of just building empathy and broadening your awareness. Right. Yeah. People are less likely to argue over, over dinner than Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, Cats are you. better than dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, okay. So the cool thing, like, so Everyone on this who listens to this show likely knows what an Airbnb is, B is, and likely almost all of them have stayed in one. There's probably a good percentage who have, who have actually tried to to operate one. I've tried to operate one as well, um, and that's one of the cool things about Airbnb is it's a very accessible side hustle for most because mm-hmm. most can just start with you know renting out a room in their home or renting out their basement or yeah, and then there's the people who. Airbnb, their investment property for the longest time. Like uh, I live, I live near Toronto. You live, um, well, you you live in Toronto now, but you can appreciate like all these condo investors. They couldn't make them cash flow unless right. they Airbnb them. Yeah, yeah, and then then exactly. then these new rules came in place. <laughs> yeah, and Actually, that's what give, I, yep. I don't know if it's fair to ask you if there's an, if you can update on where Airbnb is at for City of Toronto or. Yeah, I can uh, update just on the whole for for your listeners. As far as the way that regulations typically go is that um, uh, condo boards regulate. So depending on where in the world you are, you might call it a condo board, a strata, or an HOA. And they all pretty much outlaw Airbnb because there's so much nimbyism on in a building or for a volunteer board like that, right? They just feel like, oh, who are these strangers coming into our building? Common area wear and tear. And for the most part, Airbnb is not done right for individual um, hosts, right? There's not necessarily a, a level of uh, of vetting on the guests or 90% of all bad things that happen on Airbnb are one night minimum length of stay. So anyone who runs an Airbnb that wants to protect their unit, just in, have a two night minimum length of stay. You're less likely to have locals that are going to come and throw a one night party, right? Um, so there's, there's so many different things you can do, especially you can on Airbnb, you can set it where people can't book unless they've had past reviews on them, right? Another most bad things that happen are not only one night minimum length to stay, but they're a profile that were, was created that day, right? So there's just, um, there's a level of oversight that could be done to, to do Airbnb, right? Um, and, uh, and there's a program called the Friendly Buildings Program that Airbnb has created where they'll actually work with a condo board. They'll geo-target the address. They'll make Airbnb allowed in that building. But part of anyone who wants to Airbnb in that building will now have to follow the rules that the condo board sets. So it might be three night minimum length of stay. It might be verified government ID for all guests and past reviews on that guest. And then, uh, and then there's a revenue share that goes back from the Airbnb hosts to the actual building to offset common area wear and tears to actually reduce the condo fees and taxes that people pay. So it actually benefits everyone in the building. So it's it makes a ton of sense. It's a win-win on pretty much every level. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, most condo boards don't know about that program or they've already regulated Airbnb, which makes it really difficult to, to go backwards because you need a large vote. And then the other side of that is um, principal residents only. So most cities that regulate are moving towards what's called a prison, uh, principal residents only. Some tried one host, one home, meaning that only one user, one person can have one listing. That doesn't work as well because you probably have a sister or an uncle or other profiles that you can manage. Um, so principal resident only is true home sharing. It makes, it makes sense. It's still hard to enforce. But that's uh, that's what Vancouver has done. That's what Toronto has done, San Francisco, and many other cities around the world. So um, so yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult in uh, in Toronto. You can't sign five leases anymore and then Airbnb them full time. You actually have to live there. And we awesome. can if, um, yeah, if we if we have the time and you want to dive into how we think about 
institutionalizing short-term rentals at scale. We, we have an angle where we control entire buildings. We make them all Airbnb friendly. We coordinate with the guests. We coordinate with cleaners. We do everything white glove service for people who are owner residents in our building. And then we do a rev share on the entire booking value without any of the headaches. So people who live in a key building, they just let, they just say, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to be away this weekend. And then they come back and they have more cash in their bank and they can choose if they want to be paid out in cash or if they want to use that money to contribute to more equity in their suite more equity in their suite means they're paying less rent next month and they have access to cashing that out at any time. This is a great segue. This is a cool, cool program. Because <laughs> yeah. the, the bigger problem is, and we were talking before we were recording is how are young people supposed to get into real estate? <laughs> Cause yeah. I think we can both agree. It's probably a decent investment, <laughs> but you know, like a, a condo is, I don't know, 500 grand these days for a one bedroom. <laughs> yeah. So the down payment is hundred grand for, for 20% down. Uh, I don't know, actually, it's on your website. How long, how long does it take for someone to save for a down payment? <laughs> yeah, and In Toronto right now, it's 21 years. And in Vancouver, it's 29 years. <laughs> so, so you graduate college and you don't own an entry level condo until you're in your mid to late forties. Right. Yeah. That's like, that's good living. Yeah. <laughs> So what about your kids? You know, what about your kids' kids? It's like, it's crazy. If you're looking at, if you have three teenagers at home, you're looking at, you know, 1.5 to $2 million and just helping them get into entry-level condo. It's crazy. So just as a segue there, young people have two options, not even young people, just people in general, you're either buy or you rent. Most people are stuck renting. They're stuck on the proverbial rental treadmill. Their incomes typically aren't going up the same rate as housing prices. So they're getting further and further out of reach to ever being able to own. Or if you're lucky enough to get into the housing market, it's usually from the support of bank mom and dad. Uh, you have to have a large enough down payment to get in. And once you get in, you have to maintain a certain lifestyle to service your debt. So now everyone's house poor, you're locked in, right? So you're locked in or you're locked out with key. We're creating a, a new model to unlock home ownership, allow someone to own a home year sooner and for a fraction of the amount. We allow someone to own a home with just $15,000 or 2.5% of the value of your, their suite. The more equity they own in their suite, the less rent they pay. So they actually have the freedoms and flexibilities of renting. You're month to month. In our model, you short notice and go as if it's a rental and you can cash out as much or as little as you'd like. Even while living there, if you receive a five grand bonus or a 20 grand inheritance, you can buy more equity and immediately be paying less rent the next month. Or you can sell 20 grand worth of equity and go travel the world like your beautiful background in the Bahamas there, your Zoom background. Or you can, uh, you know, sell 20 grand worth of equity and go fund your wedding, right? Hopefully in a, in a place similar to your, your photo there. Um, so that's trying to give Cherry some, ba- some privacy. <laughs> like, I have a, here, I'll just take off my filter one second. And then I, I need to ask you, like, there's my wife. Oh, she's nice. do, she's actually doing the EO um, EO People Day right now. Oh, cool! <laughs> it looks like she's on a podcast as well. No, no, they're probably at breakout rooms right now for EO People Day. Nice. The, the quick background, folks. I know Daniel through EO Entrepreneurs Organization. Fantastic organization, by the way. Yeah, um, great group. So, so how did Key start? Where did you come up with this idea? Because it's completely off the wall. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I know. And and we've chatted with people from all around the world. I had calls just today. I've had calls with people in Hong Kong, in Manila, yeah. in Europe. Yeah. It's like it's um, and every day we're we're getting this market pull into other areas of the world. The like key resonates so deeply in Asia. It resonates so deeply in the Middle East, in South Africa, across Europe. Europe. It's it's incredible. Yeah. I had no idea that real estate worked so similarly in in just so many different markets. Even the idea of condo compared to apartment buildings, like that structure. It's called different things in different areas of the world, but it's still in Hong Kong. You're either buying, you're rather building a condo or you're building an apartment. And the same is true mm-hmm. in, uh, in, in London, England. They call it right. build to rent or build to sell, right? So anyways, It's all expensive. Wait, it's all expensive. <laughs> People are locked out. It's so expensive that developers are typically, are typically um, you know, building as quickly as possible to get their money out because construction costs are so expensive and return that capital to to the investors, wash their hands from it and move on to the next project. It's all this short sighted development cycles that are typically building for investors, not for owner residents. So we can talk, touch on this. There's many different aspects 
to key. It's hard to necessarily explain just how it came about because there's so many different aspects of my life and my co-founder's life. We came together. I pitched him this idea of democratizing real estate. He told me he's been thinking about this for over five years and has over $2 billion worth of real estate in his pipeline to do something interesting with. So every time I was, you know, at Airbnb, I was traveling a ton. Weekends, I was in Toronto. We get together and we just start rifting on this idea. What if we thought even bigger than democratizing real estate investing, but actually using investor capital to supplant a conventional mortgage? How can we help realtors that have a missing middle of leads? You know, people that they say drive till you qualify or uh, come back to me once you save up more money to be able to qualify for a mortgage. How can we help those realtors to actually empower their leads to own a home year sooner, stay part of the conversation. And then once they're actually in a better position to own a home, they can qualify with that realtor. So we actually, I guess I'll backpedal for one second. When I was at Airbnb, I saw firsthand how regulations were impacting home sharing. So that was the first side. I started thinking about principal residence only. I started thinking about how condo boards were outlawing Airbnb. I started thinking about what would it look like if we actually had entire buildings that were centered around people who would who would be able to uh, use real estate as a form of freedom and prosperity, where they could actually thrive in the units that they live, that they can be part of a community, but they could also have access to home sharing. And on the guest side, if I came through one of those buildings, it'd be pretty nice if I was welcomed in a way that I felt a sense of belonging, where there's curated dinner events or my name was brought up in a yeah. way that, you know, Erwin, welcome to Toronto, Erwin yeah. from wherever, right? So versus, just, I, yeah. When I was in Vancouver, it was like more like you had to operate in secrecy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Meet me at the alley, and we'll tell the concierge you're like my friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or or get in my car. I got all the stories. Get in my car. <laughs> like we'll drive into the underground parking, and then I'll take yeah. you up the elevator. Yeah. Like imagine being a woman traveling alone, and then having to like get into like someone's car to then go into the underground. And it's happened to, to people that I've worked with, right? So Yeah, and the instructions so, are, if anyone asks, you live here or you're visiting a friend, yeah. <laughs> you're not yeah, renting. You <laughs> yeah, you don't want to lie. And then you're in the <laughs> elevator and people are looking at you funny, you know? Yeah, because you got your luggage. <laughs> yeah. They know. Yeah. So anyways, that was one aspect of just like was back my mind thinking about the, the actual travel activated real estate. How can we empower true home sharing? Another side... Uh, my cousin and I started a laneway housing company when I was 18 years old. We converted garages to small homes. So I got obsessed from a young age of actually impacting physical space. And we would take alleyways that are pretty ugly and dodgy, and then we'd convert them into like beautiful communities where you could have a thousand square foot home, right? And uh, and and the, the entire community surrounding those alleyways would be transformed. So, and just like the amount of creativity that could go into a small space. And that same company that we started together went on to buy land and get it rezoned and went through development uh, applications and development permits and pre-sales and financing. So we now have 198 unit residential development that all started from this little laneway housing company. So I witnessed firsthand all the time costs and hassles on the developer side. And then um, as part of that was the financing. And it was just so crazy the way that real estate's currently financed. And for the last 10 years, I've been building technology companies, right? I've been focused on exponential growth. I've been focusing on low customer acquisition costs, high lifetime value, all online to offline businesses. Both my companies were, uh, were marketplaces, similar to Airbnb is a marketplace. So I started thinking through how could technology impact this space? Uh, including the ability to, to make it super easy for people to invest in real estate. And when I pitched my co-founder, um, he, uh, he's, we were both very much aligned around democratizing access to real estate investing, using technology to allow people to take construction risk or to have exposure to condo. But when the light bulb went off, it was, really much, it was very much centered around the idea of, um, Actually, before I tell you the light bulb on my side, let me just tell you a bit of my co-founder story because I think it's super interesting as far as how this idea was formed. My co-founder is one of the pioneers of SaaS, so software as a service. In 95, he created the second SaaS-based company in the world where he was selling software outside of companies' firewalls. So everyone's heads were exploding because at the time, you'd buy Microsoft Office for $1,000 and you'd pay $100 
to renew every year. And that was your upgrade, right? This annual update. And, uh, and meanwhile, he's selling software uh, outside of the company firewalls, right? He was actually getting people to consume software incrementally. And since then, SaaS has taken off like crazy. He, he uh, took the company public in 98, got on the NASDAQ, had a nice exit. Um, you now have services like AWS. Back in the 90s, people were going out and they were buying a bunch of servers. You'd spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on servers to then be able to build a site or a product to try to get it out into the world and validate it, right? So founders were raising $5 million, diluting themselves right out of the gates, 50% of their company they'd have to give up before the dot-com bubble just to be able to get off the ground. Now the pace of innovation has gone up 10x with software as a service with companies like Google Cloud or AWS. And the, the cost to launch has gone up, it's gone down 10x. So it's just this incredible innovation that we've seen, especially over the last you know, 10 years because of it, right? So, um, so here's this software as a service pioneer who then started co-investing uh, with some high net worth individuals in Toronto. One of them is Anthony Heller, who's the founder of Plaza Corp. Plaza Corp is one of the top real estate developers in Toronto. They built seven billion worth of condos. Coincidentally, the condo that I lived in at the time when I connected with Rob. So, um, so Rob decided to actually formalize a fund with Anthony Heller, some other high net worth individuals, and uh, and they decided to start investing in growth stage technology. So they started something called Plaza Ventures, and it was incredible because Rob opened up an office space with Plaza Corp. So here you have these technology growth stage technology people that are sharing office space with one of the top condo developers in Canada. And, they're with, and there's these tech guys that are seeing firsthand all the, uh, the hassles that developers go through to be able to sell their product. 10 years ago when the fund started, a dozen years ago, I should say, about 95% of all product that was being built was being built to end consumers. Owner residents. That is who you were selling to. Fast forward a dozen years, about it's completely flipped. About 95% of, of the product that we're building is being sold to investors. About 50% of that is foreign investors. The other 50% is local investors, right? <laughs> including, including our audience that we have here, which is great. Capital goes to where capital needs to go, right? This is the invisible hand. This is a, the law of economics. So it's no one's fault. It's just a way that the asset class is structured. It's an incredible place to park money, including I was talking to a developer in Vancouver. He said if he sold 300 units, 295 of them he's selling in Asia, right? It's like it's that extreme that the, the foreign and, and local investment has come for this asset class. And that's why you see condo units shrinking more and more and more, right? So these micro units. So uh, so Rob Witness first had a few different things while, while being at Plaza. The first one is the way that condos are currently financed. So they're financed by high net worth individuals. So this is one way you can get exposure to real estate uh, investing, right? You can invest into a, co a condo development where you're taking construction risk. It's a bunch of hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollar checks. The um, they typically pay a third party to raise that money. So it's two thousand phone calls to high net worth individuals, and a percentage of the money that's raised is taken by this brokerage who raises the money. And then all that money goes towards one specific development. So it's not an asset class. It's one specific building. It's siloed. Once you've raised enough money, you start a pre-sale process. You go out and you launch a brand. You're paying a lot of money in commissions and opening up a sales office and marketing efforts. So this is the first principles you have to understand as a real estate investor. It's super important to understand how this world works. So once you have enough pre-sales, you then take that package and you bring it to the bank. And it's really hard to unlock construction financing, but you have enough equity and collateral and all this incredible package of, of this brand that you've created with people who have bought into it. And then the bank gives you construction financing. You build as quickly as possible to unlock every tranche of your construction financing until you can unlock your pre-sales who move into the building. Once you unlock your pre-sales, you no longer are involved with the building. You wash your hands from it, and then you return that capital to all the investors. So this is where it gets really important to keep in mind the innovation that we're creating by restructuring this into a commercial, commercially accessible asset class. If you are the Harvard Endowment Fund, your minimum check size is $100 million, but you can't own more than 5% of a portfolio. 
So there's no way for you to have exposure to condo, which is one of the most incredible asset classes there is. I'm sure most people, many people on this call has had great wealth creation through condo. There's no way for these large pools of patient capital to actually invest in condominium because they can invest in multifamily apartment buildings for rentals. They can invest in office buildings. They can invest in ports and timberlands and all right. these other asset classes, but not condo. So you right. actually have to- Because it's one condo versus- Because it's one condo at yeah, a time. Versus a pool then, of office buildings. And right. there's a ton of different developers in all these different cities. You're not going to man. You're not going to write a couple million dollar check or even a, a $20 million check on a one building at a time basis and then have to manage all that, you're gonna invest in, uh, in, a, in a consolidation strategy. So for us, our thesis is if we can consolidate $2 billion worth of condo, we can actually unlock long-term patient capital. And there's all these big institutional players that are moving towards alternatives. So the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund right now is moving to 40% alternatives. There's $400 billion that one fund is looking to deploy into alternatives. It's crazy. It's mind boggling to try to understand how much wealth in the world um, is, is uh, being managed and wanting exposure. So that's first and foremost. So we thought if we can actually unlock large family office and institutional capital to be one single signature on a building that we're going to save a developer, you know, 10, 15 percent of non-marginal costs, we can receive real estate at a 10 to 15 percent discount. Yet, relatively speaking, developers can make the same amount of money in less time. So that was really interesting and something that was percolating in the back of our brains. Specifically for Rob, he's a co-founder of a company called Luminex. It's the largest LED retrofitting company in Canada. So he, it was really hard for him to convince any developer to put in LED lighting because they only run the lights for a year and a half. So if there's a five-year return on investment period, it doesn't make any sense for a developer to put in LED lights. So you actually put in a crappy product that's going to end up in a landfill and then and then put it on the shoulders of a volunteer condo board to then make the adjustment when they take over management. And that's, that's just one small example of the misalignments of interest between the developer and the owner operator, right? They just don't, they don't have, a, there's no, there's no reason for a developer to put in geothermal as an example or to really invest in sustainability. So that was the second thing outside of financing costs. The other thing was just sustainability. And then the third one was the owner of uh, the, the amount of foreign investors uh, and local investors that were actually impacting uh, the, the, the local owner residents um, where that same money could be working alongside owner residents, giving people an incredible way to passively invest in real estate, but actually helping people own a home year sooner. And then the fourth aspect was just this, this affordability crisis, right? Uh, young people being locked out um, and, uh, and we read about it in the news on a daily basis. So Anyways, that that's the founding story. We got together. We put our heads together. We started. Oh, just let me pause yeah. you for a second. That's yep. incredible. I had no idea that's how that like the front end is just a huge part of how this can work. Yeah, there's a lot of financial engineering, right? Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and it because really, on the surface value, like how, how, how the heck is this supposed to work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different stakeholders in key. There's a lot of different stakeholders. There's government, there's developers, there's capital partners, there's the end consumers, mm -hmm. and then there's and then there's also partners that we work with uh, to be able to manage short-term rentals and everything else. So you can think of us as a as a multi-sided marketplace, more than just supply and demand, right? right. There's, there's a lot of people we inter interact with. Interesting. So yeah, keep, I know sorry, keep a lot going. of information. <laughs> it's just like fire, no, but the thing uh, is, the fire hose. The thing is, like, like when I'm reading your website, like I don't get it. <laughs> but yeah. when you when you lay it all out, then like, okay, that makes a lot more sense, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if you make the fundraising, if you make the the financing easier for the development, then that's a win for all parties, except for the exactly. investor, except for the small investor. But <laughs> no, 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 this is where it's actually a win for the small investor, though. Because now they can have better returns than traditional real estate uh, investing because we raise equity and then corporate debt. So corporate debt is actually less cost of capital than a conventional mortgage. So we actually passive investors now can have a better, a superior investment in real estate while without managing it 
while actually making a difference in the world and empowering people to own yours sooner. You can make the case for realtors that realtors are better off too, because now you have realtors who, um, without doing any work, they can just refer someone our way. We close someone, we pay them uh, a commission based on, on closing someone, and we keep their brand front and center. So we even received an investment recently from the National Association of Realtors. So this is the second largest lobby group in the United States, right? Only next to the National Rifle Association. <laughs> the only bigger <laughs> lobby group in the U.S. And their mandate, they, they actually can't invest in anything that isn't good for realtors. Um, and they see this as an opportunity to actually address the missing middle and help realtors make money, but also help them nurture their lead list, keep their leads warm until they can qualify for home. This all so, sounds too good to be true, Daniel. <laughs> I think that we get that a lot. We get that a lot. How and can you make all parties happy? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, the one side, of, I mean, brokers that are that are like the, the people that are helping other people raise money from a bunch of high net worth individuals. They're, they're not. They're they're cutting, any, yeah. If you look at the 10 to 12 percent or 10 to 15 percent of non-marginal costs that we're stripping out, that that savings coming from somewhere. So that's. Mm-hmm. That's to some extent. There's brokers. There's legal fees. There's uh, sales and marketing costs. So that's what we're stripping out, um, but with a lot more efficiencies. And just to bring it all home, and just how how much we've built here. Here's an example of something that just happened. Just the other day, we had uh, a young single mom, a woman of color, who is an Instacart shopper. So she's a gig worker. And she bought a house with key pulled over on the side of the road in 15 minutes on her iPhone with 15 grand. Right. So you can imagine, like, compare that to the way home ownership currently works. 15 minutes, she was able to own a home on her phone. So we've built a ton of technology now. We've actually built this fintech layer where we can verify your bank balance. We can verify your income. We can do KYC and AML. We can actually understand your credit history and your, your, uh, your type of debt, if it's credit card debt, if it's, you know, student debt, that's very different. Um, Virtual walkthroughs and staging, which isn't anything crazy, but everything that's done within an app to be able to go from 15 minutes to then uh, to to home ownership, where you actually own equity in your suite, you actually have uh, have true ownership in your suite, but without any of the, uh, you know, the paperwork or weeks or months of closing. So, so so following this example, then, so how is the rest of the property financed then? So the single model. So owns... Yeah, go ahead. So, so here's how financing works. We raise large pools of capital as we we've, we've discussed. So let's say 40% equity. We then uh, raise corporate debt. So we leverage that equity up another 60%. So now hundred percent of the real estate that we're buying is financed by passive investor equity and corporate debt. We then buy an individual unit just to make it simple. And we allow someone to own a home, which is 2.5%. So let's call it $15,000 because that's around average for a condo in Toronto. They can own more than 15, they can own more than 15,000, right? They can choose to, uh, to put in 50,000 if they want. Um, and the more equity they own, the less rent they pay. So for us, we don't care how much people own, right? If they own more, then we can, that equity can be deployed into other real estate. It can be used to service our debt. It can be used to provide liquidity to other equity investors, or it can be used as equity to continue to go out and buy more real estate. If they if they sell, then the rents go up, right? So they're actually, anyone who lives in, our, in a unit is receiving a discount to market rent. So maybe they're only receiving around a couple percent discount to begin with, but the more equity they own, the less rent they pay. So it's just like it's it's analogous to a mortgage, really. Uh, there's differences because with a mortgage, you're paying years of upfront uh, more interest than principal. In our model, it's a linear line. It's not steep interest curve. It's linear. So um, if you pay off your mortgage, you don't pay any financing costs. Your mortgage is paid off. You still have baseline condo fees and taxes. Our model is the exact same. There's two aspects that make up a monthly rent. One is baseline taxes and condo fees. The other one is financing costs. So you're receiving a discount on the financing costs all the way to zero. If you own the same amount of equity as your suite is worth, you're not paying any financing costs. You're only paying baseline taxes and fees, just like a mortgage that's being paid off. 
But what's nice about our model is it's completely flexible. Every month you buy up more or you sell down, depending on how your life changes. You can set uh, four savings plans where you're putting $500 extra away every month or one-time contributions. And plus on top of it, even if you decide to put $0 away, you still have a small percentage that's going to buy more and more equity every month while also receiving a discount to rent. So if I make it super simple, if you were to compare traditional home ownership to renting to our new model, financially speaking, you can be the best off with traditional home ownership if you buy and hold a place for a long period of time. So the assumptions there is that you have enough money for a down payment and you have uh, you have a certain amount of cash flow to then be able to pay down your mortgage, right? Uh, and you're okay with the lifestyle that that creates. Um, so that's that's one piece. But financially speaking, if you buy and hold for a long period of time, that's your best investment. Uh, renting, we're pretty much always a better alternative to renting because you're receiving a discount to market rent. Plus you have equity in the real estate market that's compounding in value with what the real estate market is doing. We can Key can be better off than traditional home ownership if you were to buy a place traditionally and then sell it within you know, a couple of years, a short amount of time, just because of all the buy sell costs. So if we're ever talking to someone and they're considering traditional home ownership or our model, um, traditional home ownership makes a ton of sense if you have the capital and cash flow and security and confidence that you're going to own this piece of, uh, of this home for a number of years, then that's a great route. If you, uh, if you have uncertainty like me, when I moved to Toronto and I hired a realtor and I wanted to find a place to buy, but I didn't know how long Toronto would be home for, if I bought it and sold it a year later, not really getting any further ahead, that's a perfect use case. And really the people that we found that are buying into key are, uh, are mostly people that don't have the money saved up for a down payment yet or value their freedom too much to then have to maintain a certain lifestyle to service their debt. Uh, so to continue with the example of someone who's putting down two and a half percent or 15,000, what would their rent rent uh, monthly rent payments be? So instead of $2,000 a month, maybe they're paying something closer to 1900. You know, this does not exist anywhere else. <laughs> it doesn't. No, I've, I've chatted with people in every area of the world at this point, And that's part of the challenge that it doesn't exist anywhere else. But I will say this idea couldn't have existed five years ago. It's just there. There is um, the technology wasn't even built for us to be able to automate so much of what we're doing. Like we integrate with Plaid as an example. That's a scraper for banks, so we can actually use existing software to be able to uh, to be able to verify people's income. We integrate with other service providers to be able to do high value transactions. To be able to actually debit someone's account fifteen thousand dollars while they're on their phone. That didn't exist a number of years ago. So, so much fintech innovation has happened to allow this business model uh, to exist. And then on top of it, you layer on a number of other things that has changed in the world, such as the affordability crisis. It used to take four years to save up for a down payment in Toronto. You know, this, is, this isn't that new, but, it's, but COVID has a flan the, a fan the flames. And then, uh, and then you can also look at other aspects that have made it just really difficult for uh, for this model to exist, you know, 10 years ago, including the rise of alternative assets um, and, uh, and large pools of patient capital looking to have exposure in the space. So even though you're paying rent, you're the owner. So no one can move in and then you have to move out. Yeah, correct. You're, you're the co-owner. So it's a, it's a co-owner agreement. Um, you can, you can renovate, um, you know, you, you can, it really feels like traditional home ownership because it is home ownership um it's principal residence only in our system so you can't buy five units and then sublease them or airbnb them full-time you actually have to live there and the idea is because we want if people want to invest in real estate soon they're going to be able to invest on the same terms as some of the top investors in the world right soon you'll be able to invest in the same terms as a harvard endowment fund who might be investing in uh in the mutual fund trust if you will so that's what we want to get to is, is, yeah, you want to be a real estate investor? Here's a much better real estate investment than a conventional REIT as an example. Um, if you or, or buying a condo and then becoming a landlord and having to manage it all yourself. You want to be an owner resident? Then here's an opportunity to own a home year sooner. Uh, but, there's, but there's no opportunity for you to you know, 
buy multiple, sublease them, and manage them on your own. Right. Well, you're trying to help the little person here. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to we're, we're trying to be you know as for the people as we can. We we're trying yeah. to be for the the parent who has um, you know a kid that's graduating college and can actually help them own a home without sacrificing their freedoms. We were we're working with Tibetan refugees. We're working with grade five school teachers. We're working with um, our first owner resident, a 47 year old who works in tech, who never bought a couch before because he kept uh, renting furnished rentals to eventually own a home, saving up to own a place. Like this was like core in his DNA mm-hmm. to, to buy a home. And now he, uh, through one of our partners, was bought all his furniture when he moved into his suite earlier this year. This yeah. is awesome. Cause, cause, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like the rent to own model as an investment. Like this is for the for the tenant for the for the person who's going to live in the property. This is significantly cheaper. <laughs> well, yeah. The thing with rent to own models is that there's you there's a trigger event where you have to make a decision of do I want to continue to rent or do I want to become an owner, right? And do I forfeit the money that was going towards me qualifying for a mortgage if I continue to be an owner or do mm-hmm. I want to actually qualify for mortgage? All the different, there's so much popping up right now in the ecosystem. The main difference between what currently exists and our model is with key, you can own a home without owning a mortgage, period. There's no mortgage in our system. There's never a mortgage. You truly have the freedom. But, you know, if you want a mortgage and you want to own a home with maximum leverage, we help you get there a year sooner. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is. (laughs) <laughs> you, you hear that a lot though right yeah it's, i mean it's fun right it's it's so it's such a different strategy that it, at the very least it's intellectually stimulating and people rather get it um or else it you know or else it can take some time to explain it and i think right. you know we're working on how can we explain it as simple as possible without having to get into every aspect of what we're doing and why it makes sense right. um but i mean most people don't understand how a mortgage works right Right. Like we do it because that's the way the world works. And we all, we all use this thousand year old debt instrument called the mortgage, but mm-hmm. people don't even realize that they're paying more interest and in principal of their home until they receive their first statement, right. Or refinancing or all the different aspects of a mortgage. So hopefully we can get there where we have a brand that's just built on trust. People are seeing the success that's coming from our owner residents and the quality of their life and the different ways that we can interact and activate the brick and mortar, um, which is a, for another podcast, we can dive into everything we're doing layering on top. And we talked a bit about Airbnb. There's a lot of other services and our unique loyalty programs that we're rolling out. <laughs> Cause uh, you, yeah. you mentioned earlier, like if you're one of these owners, you can rent out your space on the week. If you're not there for the weekend or whatever, mm. if you're yeah, out of town, you're traveling. Yeah. And it's just really just, you know, just punched in the app. I'm not here. Rent it out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then it's just a revenue share. <laughs> we we clean it. We do safe storage of personal personal belongings if that's what someone wants. Coordinate with the with the guest. So you know, it's concierge that's going to welcome these people in and and uh, and create a 21st century experience. You know. So so yeah, and Airbnb this is super- nuts, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I brought this to some leadership at Airbnb when I was still there and wanted to hear their thoughts on the idea. And they were super supportive. They were just, you know, they wanted to, to continue to sync on this idea and track the progress. So that Airbnb is not going to do this themselves. They'd work with a company like us that's bringing it into the world. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so if not, if not us, then who, and if not now, then when, and it's definitely not an easy business. There's been a ton of challenges that we've been up against. Yeah, it's just even out. explaining it to people. <laughs> yeah, communication is like one of many challenges, right? There's an education curve that we have to climb and we have to fund, right? It's not going to be right. cheap to, to be able to educate government, to educate developers, to educate finance, finance uh, capital partners, to educate the banks and our debt instruments to be able to get on side. So yeah, there's, there's a lot. I think that's the biggest challenge is the number of stakeholders. It's not like... Um, it's not like other businesses where you have a very clear idea of who your customer is or who those stakeholders are. Um, and, and it's just, you know, like one or two, two sided marketplaces are tough. Like Airbnb is a tough business because it's two, two different businesses that you have to run the guest side and the host side. For us, we have like five. (laughs) 
You know, we have five different aspects of our business that are all equally as important, all to then help the one end consumer that you go to our website and you think we're just like this direct consumer brand for home ownership. There's so much more than that. What I will say, if anyone is on the listening that has empty vacant condo suites, this is how we want to grow as a technology company, is now that we've built all this tech, we can actually make it super easy for someone to attach their suite into our model. We call it home ownership as a service. So we allow people to own a home year sooner through the key, the key model. Um, and then we provide better returns than if it was a traditional rental. So you're receiving equity. We have debt partners in the background to take up or take down the debt, depending on what the owner resident does. We have low costs of debt. We're working with some really strong capital partners in the background. So that's how we'll we'll scale as a technology company. We'll scale from Toronto into 50 to 100 cities around the world where we can work with large developers to buy entire buildings or large blocks of suites or work with asset managers who have traditional apartment buildings that then we can empower their tenants to become homeowners. And we'll work with individual real estate investors to allow them to empower their uh, their vacant condo suites that a lot of people don't want to live in right now because of the state of the world with COVID. And we make it super easy. We have way more demand than we have supply. So instead of places sitting empty, let's get a homeowner in there. That's awesome. No. Oh. Oh, I had a question. I lost it. Uh, no I know. I know. There's a lot here. Um, I'm curious for uh, for feedback from anyone who listened to this. I'm I'm always available. I'm always happy to chat and really trying to understand the best way to tell our story right now. So, um, so yeah, trying to uh, also validate the different assumptions that we have around scaling through other condo developers, asset managers. And what we call the, you know, the onesie twosies. So the people who own one or two units or families that own 30 units and how we can just make it an absolute no brainer to attach that inventory to our platform. Um, and we make it super easy with our financial model to understand the return profile of keeping those units as purely rentals or if, if you attach them onto our platform. This is fascinating stuff. I hope the listeners enjoying because this is so different than the usual. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wonder. Uh, I wonder. Uh, there should be some level of like a poll afterwards of uh, of rating people's grasp on our model now that we've chatted it through for a while. If it's like ten would be like I totally get it and I love it, and one would be like I have no idea what any of that means. Right. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, soon, soon, soon with Earn Media, um, with launching a brand, with uh, with people talking about us and word of mouth, um, it will become a lot easier to understand. We've had the Globe and Mail reach out to us a couple times to do an article. We told them we're just not ready yet. We have way more demand already just from word of mouth than supply on our platform. So we have a few milestones that we're working towards before really opening up. So we've been in, we've been in stealth. You know, pseudo stealth. We have a website and a LinkedIn page. That's about it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, honored to to be on your platform and giving people a bit of a sneak peek before we start to make any noise about what we're building. This is, yeah, my mind's blown. Uh, yeah, for because um, for mortgage people, like mortgage professionals and realtors, like they should be all over this, assuming you have supply. Oh, and then the, sorry, the question I want to ask is where where are your buildings? Like, where can people? Yeah, um, so they're all downtown core Toronto right now. Um, we're talking that's to Toronto, some, eh? center of yeah, the universe. It's the best place to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talking to some developers in Vancouver right now. Um, and then uh, spoke to a developer in Boston today, um, looking at uh, some, a number of markets in the US, Austin, um, Miami, Seattle. So, but right now it's just Toronto. And we thought it's better to go with any marketplace. Um, it's better to go vertical than it is to go horizontal. So let's really prove out that this is a model that deeply resonates to have a hundred people who absolutely love us instead of spreading ourselves uh, too thin and having a thousand people who like are trying to figure out mm -hmm. if they like the process or not. So we're providing white glove service. We're going over and above. We're measuring everything. Our sales cycle from we've had someone in and uh, in a few weeks, go from an Instagram ad and not know anything about us to then uh, move in as an owner resident. <laughs> so it's a, 
<laughs> yeah, it's unprecedented. We've had our our sales cycle is incredibly short, um, and uh, and there's been a lot of pull into different areas of of the city. Um, you know, we're we're downtown core. There's people who want to live uh, in Midtown or Uptown. Um, there's people who want to live in in Kingston or you know Waterloo. And, uh, and we even have people that are coming across our website in different countries now. I mean, like, when are you going to be in uh, San Francisco is an, ex- an obvious example, but um, it's incredible to see, you know, people from the Middle East. We have a Muslim community that um, with their religion can't actually hold a mortgage, right? Um, can't, can't have debt. So we actually provide a, a mortgage-free, debt-free home ownership solution. So there's mm-hmm. just so many aspects of this that are that are pretty interesting. So I'm excited for you to follow along and uh, for us to continue the conversation, hopefully give your uh, your listeners a, a good update um, soon enough. This is pretty awesome. You should talk to my buddy, Charles. He just got approval for a six story building in Hamilton in Westdale. Oh, so really? it's, right, it's right near, near the university. I don't know if that's fits your, if that yeah, fits anything I mean, you'd yeah, be interested we, in. We love having these conversations and it's great to have them early. Well, it's the best time for us to get in is before a developer starts pre-sales and then we can try to take the entire building if it makes sense. But mm-hmm. um, but for that, we need to find the right capital partner that then wants to come in and and uh, and buy the building with us. On the other side of it is, you know, just keeping 10% of your suites carved out and then you can take your exit, you can defer your taxes. So it's much better from a financial perspective, take some cash off the table. So now you're just playing with house money and you keep some suites in our model that's completely managed on our end. Mm-hmm. He's planning on keeping it as a rental, but uh, oh, nice! Yeah, let me, I'll reach out to him see if he wants to connect. I'm sure they want to connect. <laughs> He's and an the old member as well. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, I found that um, that all 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 developers for the most part um, are happy to connect just because it's so different. You know, it's just yeah. so. It's so uh, not the way that the world currently works. And we should grab lunch. Like- yeah, yeah, Toronto. Exactly. yeah i'd love to awesome awesome all right D- daniel where, where can people learn about this um so yeah, for example have... we we have quite a few realtors on this on the show we have some investors i'm sure people know some young people that need to be able to get into the market where, yeah, where can people follow up where can people learn yeah, about so, this so uh our our brand name is key k-e-y our url is life at key.com we're life at key on all social media channels like Instagram or Twitter um, or TikTok. <laughs> we have uh, someone on our team that's on, on TikTok. Uh, yeah. We, what else? Um, and my email is Daniel at life. At oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we have a couple. We I've had complaints from past guests that they still get emails. <laughs> Are you sure you want to put it out there? <laughs> I'm happy to put it out there. I'm happy. To put okay. It out there. Okay. You've been warned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is my uh, my life's work, right? So I'm always available and happy to talk to anyone that that's uh, aligned and trying to uh, put a dent in the universe and, and want to help us with the mission of creating world real estate as a source of freedom and prosperity for everyone. So yeah, we I, we got to talk more, man. This is this is awesome. You know, I, you know, as a as a real estate investor, like it's it's great, but you know, it's like how do I make a bigger dent, right? Nice. No, so. I, I appreciate that and. Uh, like I said, it's been a crazy, a crazy journey trying to get this off the ground. And now we have owner residents living in suites. So it's March 25th, 2021. Hopefully we can timestamp this. We have our patent pending, which has been a lot of work of actually going through the patent process on this home ownership engine. We have uh, we have uh, some really strong capital partners behind us, some top tier VCs that invest in fintech. Um, we're, uh, we're looking at being able to unlock a lot more supply and that's probably going to come from once we're more public and we're doing more podcast appearances like this and getting the word out. Um, I think, uh, one, one area, uh, that we could use support. Um, so just, uh, uh, in tech, I feel like you always end the conversation of like, how can I help? How can I be of service? So for selfish reasons, how can we help? Limited- how can, we yeah. help? How can we help more young people get into real estate? Like seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think anyone, this audience, anyone, not just young people. We're always hiring software engineers, <laughs> of course, <laughs> any technology company is. So if you know any good software engineers, but <laughs> I would, I would say um, the, the, the best way that you can help would just um, be, uh, would probably be to get involved and to start learning about our model and being able to refer people our way. We have the past president of the Toronto real estate board who's full-time on our team. Um, 
who is Mark McLean. Uh, Mark is always happy to take calls. When he was a past pre- when he was the president of uh, the Toronto Real Estate Board, he would be hit up all the time by realtors, and it was really hard to make time to speak to realtors. Now he's doing it constantly. You know, he's always talking to realtors around the world, or sorry, in, in specifically in Toronto. Um, so, um, so yeah, he was he was also he brought Sotheby's to Canada, and he uh, he ran Condos.ca. He was the president of Condos.ca. So. I'd be happy to, to connect him to anyone on this show that would like to learn more of how, how we work with realtors. And, uh, and yeah, if there's anyone that has an audience, you know, as anyone that's actually managing a mailing list, um, we found that it makes realtors look good to be on the cutting edge and being able to showcase a bit of what we're doing. So if you'd like to do an email blast to, uh, to your audience, um, assuming you're, you're somewhere in Canada, um, <laughs> then, uh, then we're happy to do that because, our, our model, the way that we built it out, is going to be able to scale really quickly in Canada, and hopefully, we're in the U.S. soon. Awesome! Yeah, send me some, send me some details. Hey yeah, guys, I can't believe this stuff, man. <laughs> this is crazy. Oh. Awesome, Daniel. Th- thanks for sorry for having you keeping you over time. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> really well, enjoyed this. Thanks yeah, for doing this. Keep going, man. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, we're you know how bad here. the problem is probably more than I know the pro- how bad the problem is. So. But yeah. it's a bad problem. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it just it impacts so many people. It's more than a generational crisis. We would say generational crisis of home ownership. We only say that because there are people who got into home ownership early, different generations. That is not the same challenge, but it's it's more than that now. You know, it's the new immigrants that are coming to the country. It's it's people who have who, who have moved or even have sold their place, and now they need to find another way to 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 have a place to live. So, um, so yeah, this this is a massive uh, top three challenge that that our society faces right now. Yeah. Um, it's ranked second in as a challenge in in Toronto and Vancouver by the Vancouver and Toronto Foundation. Number one is loneliness. So hopefully we can help address that as well. <laughs> So how can we not have, you know, condo buildings where people walk in and then just put their head down? And but number two is uh, affordability. Um, so anyways, it's a bigger problem than people realize, because if you're a lifelong renter, the probability of your the next generation being a lifelong renter is pretty high. Right. And then it never stops for, mm-hmm. for, for all future generations. We have a shrinking oh. middle class. This the middle class that, that we know it is. Uh, in the history of the world is being a small little blip that we've had such a strong middle class. And, uh, and most of that middle class was centered around the ability to actually own your home and, uh, and, and grow wealth with your home. Right. And now we have, uh, we've had a, the dynamics change 180%, right. And it's just, uh, it's, it's a, it's a very different world that we live in now than, than it was 10 years ago. Uh, and very different world that we live now than, 13 months months ago pre covid right so <laughs> um, but yeah this was this was a lot of fun i always enjoy our chats looking forward to grabbing lunch and like i said if anyone's interested in connecting daniel at lifeikey.com i uh, i don't discriminate on anyone who's interested in learning more about what we're building awesome daniel thank you again for doing this and yeah keep up the great work all right yeah thanks thanks so much all right have a great night all right see you, everyone thank you